Father, thank you so much that you loved us so much that you sent your son. How many times we are so forgetful, so lost. We worry about so many things that are happening around us that don't make the difference of our salvation. But your love, your grace, and mercy that pours down on us and our relationship with you is what matters. So, Father, we tell you we love you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Morning. How's everybody doing? So I got to ask, did you enjoy your rain? It's it's been kind of unusual. It, it's monsoon season. I, I hear. I, I've heard that word tossed around on the news. I haven't seen much to show for it, but this week at least we got some rain. I got a question for everybody. While you're getting your Bible and you can flip over to John chapter 13, I got a question for you. If someone comes up to you and tells you, I have some good news and bad news, are you one of those people when asked that question, which would you like to hear? Are you a good news first or are you a bad news first? Really? Okay, I, I'm just curious. Bad news, raise your hand first. Good news first. Wow, I thought it was going to be like 50-50. Wow, way more people want that bad news. Is it like tearing a Band-Aid off? You just want to get the bad part over with and move on to the good? Is, is that it? There you go. Can only... Only look, look up from here. That, that's true. Bad news first. All right. Well, we've been looking at John, going through John. The disciples are, are at the Last Supper. Jesus is sharing some news with the disciples. And honestly, he's kind of at a point where he's got some bad news to share with them. As a matter of fact, he's already... Here, uh, before we're going to look at, at the end of 13 and moving on to 14, Jesus has already told the disciples that one of them would betray him. Peter didn't take that very well. Peter got a little put out, and Jesus said, By the way, you, you know, you're going to actually deny me three times before sunrise tomorrow. So he already shared that there were some bad things going on with the disciples. We talked about last week how the disciples were kind of arguing amongst themselves and, and thinking who was going to be first in this new kingdom. So it was kind of a, a tumultuous night. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. They shared that meal. But Jesus has more bad news to share. And I guess like you, Jesus gives the bad news first, followed by the really, really good. So if you got your Bible handy, let's take a, a look at some of this news. John chapter 13, verse 33 is where we're going to start today. Hope you got that ready. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples that night, and he said, My children, I will be, will be with you only a sh little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. He goes on to tell them, kind of changing topic, after I'm gone, you should go ahead and love each other. But then John records in his gospel the obvious question. Wait, wait, wait. You, you just said you're leaving. Let, let's, let's 
revisit that. Go back to what you just said, Jesus. You're leaving and we can't follow? Where are you going would probably be the number one question that they would have that night. John records Simon Peter asking just that exact question. Verse 36, Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Seems obvious that would be the thing to want to know. Even though Jesus had just said, where I'm going, you cannot follow. They, especially Peter, the gung-ho disciple, probably is thinking, I'd like to tag along. So tell us where you're going. Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Ooh, that, that's a little bit better news, getting a little bit better, a little bit more optimistic. Would you have some questions if you were one of those disciples that night? Would you still be wondering what's going on? Jesus knew that they were upset. Jesus saw what, what the room was like. He could read that room. And in chapter 14, very first thing, right out of the gate in verse 1, he tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled. They had to be worried. They had to be upset. Their master that they've been following for three years had just said that he's leaving and they can't follow, at least right now. So it says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. There's some good news. Jesus is leaving. That's kind of difficult for them to hear. They were upset. Don't let your hearts be troubled. They were surely troubled. But then he's saying, I'm going away to prepare a place. My father's house has many rooms. I don't know if any of you were listening to 1990s contemporary Christian music. Anybody ever hear of Audio Adrenaline? Every, <laughs> Gene's hand's like way up. Every time I, I read this section here, this scripture, I think of Audio Adrenaline. Big house. Ooh, we even got people doing the moves now. <laughs> it's a big, big house with lots and lots of room. Jesus is leaving the disciples to go to his father and not to leave them forever, but to go and prepare a place so that he can come back and bring them along with him. That's some good news. Now, if you were a disciple, would you still have some questions in your mind? Would you still be unsure? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Was there still something troubling to them? Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I am going. Did they know what he was talking about? You know the way. As the disciples that night, I, I got to imagine, I, I put myself in their spot. That's a head scratcher. Wait a minute, you just told us you're leaving. You're going to your father's to prepare a place for us. You're going to come back and you're going to take us. But now you say, but we already know the way? How can that be? As a disciple that night, I imagine that they didn't understand what he's getting at. Jesus has yet to be crucified. He's yet to be resurrected. Of course, no ascension to the Father at this point. No Holy Spirit on Pentecost yet. 
the disciples' understanding of Jesus to this point has been spotty at best. When we read in the gospel what Jesus was trying to teach them, and and this time, this last night of his life, trying to prepare for his departure, give them last minute instructions, it's been hard for them. And now he tells them, you already know the way. Would you have a question? Would that be still troubling? Thomas. What's Thomas's, uh, what's Thomas's known for, I guess? His nickname, Doubting Thomas. That guy's never going to live that down. You know, he, he's got an eternity to live with that name. Good news is he has an eternity. Thomas said to him, Lord, We don't know where you are going. So how in the world can we know the way? How can we know the way? Don't know what you're talking about. We have no idea of where you're going to be. We don't understand any of this. How do we know the way? Have you ever felt kind of in that position? You knew you had to be somewhere, that your life had to be something, but you just didn't really know the way. I think we all kind of get to that point sometimes. We don't know. We feel like we should. Thomas has got to be in that position. Jesus just said, you will know the way. And he speaks up, but we don't. How can we? Jesus gives a response. A a, a very famous one, as a matter of fact. 14.6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus himself is the way to the Father, is what he's saying. And by the way, he's not saying this lightly. When Jesus starts with, I am, does anybody get what that reference is? That harkens back to something. Moses. Moses was at the burning bush, and God spoke to him, I am spoke to Moses, I am who I am. It was a divine name that God called himself. And if you read through all of John, you see seven different times Jesus references that Moses line, that that line from Exodus, I am, God's name for himself. And here he's saying, I am the way. You say you don't know the way. How can we know the way? I am the way. Let me show you something. Jesus was set to be the way before he was even born. In Matthew chapter 1, angels come and make announcements. Mary has her own annunciation. Joseph has his annunciation. You're going to have a son. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua, Joshua, we might say. Jesus. Anybody know what that means? Lord saves. Jesus was going to, by name They knew, at least Joseph was to know, that Jesus, before he was ever born, was going to be the one to save his people. He is that way. That was set to be God's plan of salvation. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter, remember Peter was the one, we don't know where you're going. 
uh, how are we going to go? Peter had questions that night at the Last Supper. But it, at that Pentecost, when he gets up to preach, he talks about that. And he says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Little sixth grade side lesson. You can feel free to take notes if you want to. Let's go back to sixth grade grammar. An article is a word that points out which noun someone is referring to. You all understand nouns, right? Person, place, thing, or idea. You know, man, woman, book, chair, freedom, liberty, person, place, thing, or idea. Nouns. If you are referring to a noun in conversation or in writing, you can say a man, a woman, an apple, and that points out you're referring to any of those, not specifics. You're not specifying which one you're actually talking about. But those are indefinite articles. There is one definite article that points to I am speaking about one item, one person, one place. The, for example, president. If I say the president, you all understand who it would be referencing. If I said the building, it would be the building that's here. The is a definite article. Which word did Jesus use when he said, I am the way? I am it. I am the one. Salvation is found in no one else. That's it. That's all. Jesus is the only way, the only path to get to God. There isn't anything else. Jesus also didn't just say the way. He talked about, I am the truth. Do you know that John, in his gospel uses that word, which, by the way, the Greek word for truth is aletheia. He used that word 25 times in his gospel. Matthew used truth, the word truth, aletheia, the Greek word, since your gospels were written in Greek originally, once. Mark and Luke wrote the word aletheia for truth, three times each. John wrote about Jesus speaking about the truth or Jesus being truth 25 times. It's a huge theme in John's gospel. From the very beginning, the, the introduction to John's gospel there in chapter 1, uh, I want to quote you John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Which, by the way, you remember... We talked about the word. Who's that? That's Jesus. John is talking about Jesus being the word. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus himself was truth. Embodied in flesh in this world God's word in the flesh, the truth of God's word living amongst men. John wrote about that truth. In John chapter 8, Jesus himself had something interesting to say here about the truth. John chapter 8, verse 31 Jesus is speaking to a large group of people. And he said to all those who were gathered around him, those he had more uh, disciples, more followers than the 12 that you know by name. There were others. And he's speaking to them and he said, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. And what is it that the truth will do? The truth will set you free. If Jesus was the one who came with the truth, I am the truth, 
Jesus is saying something interesting here, that he will be the one to set us free, to set those, in that case, those followers free. So what is it that truth sets people free from? What is it that Jesus sets people free from? Are they free from financial burdens, free from pain, free from suffering, free from just the the curse of this world? It's free from sin. What is the wages of sin? If Jesus is the truth and the truth will set you free, Jesus can free you from death. I am the way and the truth. I'm the way to the Father. If you believe in me, I can set you free from death. As a matter of fact, there's a very famous verse in your Bible about that. Because remember, what's the third thing that Jesus told his disciples that night? I am the way, the truth, life. If you're set free from death, that means you're going to be alive. Well, the most famous verse of all, John 3.16. Go ahead and turn over there. If you're not familiar with it, I bet you probably got it memorized. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus told the disciples that night, I am the way, I am the truth. Now he's saying, I am the life. You see how all three of those kind of play together. The way to the Father, the path. Believe in me. The truth that he's the word in flesh in this world that will set you free. Free from what? Free from death, the death that comes from sin. They're all connected. Now, I got to tell you, if you've looked at those I am statements in John, I am the bread of life. Heard that one before? How did Jesus Prove that he's the bread of life. He fed the 5,000. Remember how last week I was talking to you about object lessons? Jesus would often, of course, teach in parables, but we kind of don't really pay attention that he used objects in real life to make spiritual connections, to teach lessons using the things around him. I am the bread of life, and Jesus goes out, and he feeds the 5,000. He's kind of putting proof to his claim. He can feed people, sustain life himself. I am the living water. Want to know where Jesus said that? Woman at the well. What do you know? There's water right there. Jesus says... I am the resurrection. I am the life. Know where he said that? If he's the life, the truth, or the way, the truth, and life, I am the resurrection and the life. That's another one of those I am statements. Anybody know where Jesus happened to be when he said that? On the way to Lazarus' tomb. John 11 Just before Jesus' arrival that last week in Jerusalem, uh, last chance that Jesus has before getting there for that Passover week, Jesus stops at, at Mary and Martha's home because he had heard that Lazarus, first of all, was sick, and then Lazarus, of course, had, had passed. The sisters are, are upset. They're, they're grieving. They run out to meet him. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Anyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? 
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And how does he go about proving that, verifying that claim? He raises Lazarus. He goes into that tomb. Lazarus. There's, there's a, another uh, contemporary Christian song, Carmen. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is raised from the dead. See, Jesus could make claims like, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, because it was Jesus, and only Jesus, because remember, he's not a way, he is the way, that could actually verify those claims. He could prove what he was saying was true. You've heard people say, put up or shut up. Well, Jesus could do both. He could put up and he didn't have to shut up because he proved it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And and honestly, the big question, the, the final question, at least the question for you all, happens to be the same one here that he asked that day of Lazarus's resurrection. Do you believe? The New Testament makes it clear from the Gospels on through the letters that the way to God's Father where Jesus is preparing a place is through faith in Him. Believing in those claims that He made about Himself. Those claims that He verified, that He proved. If you give your life to Jesus you have a place in that home with him. That's how you can get there. How can we get there? It's by faith. Do you believe? Why don't you all stand with me? Because honestly, there's no better ending that I can come to for the sermon today than to ask you to contemplate that question. How do you answer that question, do you believe? If faith in Jesus is that way, and and you want to to live, you you want to be part of of Jesus' home with the Father, there is no other way. He is it, according to the Bible that you got there in your lap. So the question is, is do you believe? I think that's a a thing that we all need to consider here as we close. We're going to have this invitation time, so I'm going to ask our our worship team to come forward. And we're just going to pray now for this invitation, but I'm also going to ask that you really think about how you answer that question. If you can't say that you believe in Jesus then don't talk yourself into believing that there's some other way that you can earn your way, that there's some other belief system. Jesus is it, the way. You have to believe in him. No better time to do that than this morning. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I'm going to stand right here during our invitation. You're welcome while our worship team is planning to step forward and come and talk with me. I'll pray with you about that decision. But let's pray right now. Father, we just come before you. We thank you for this time that we get to come each morning and and just listen to your word. And and this morning, to see how you are the way, it is true that you are the life. And, And so, Father, I pray for each person that's here that they have made that decision that Martha decision to believe in you, that we are a part of that kingdom, that we have a place in that home. But Father, I pray for anyone that's not made that decision, that your Holy Spirit can work in a life and and reveal what needs to be done. Father, I pray always for your will. I pray in your name. Amen.
Thank you all. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. I appreciate your effort, the time that you guys take to, to come in and, and do that. Appreciate that. I was just thinking about our announcements. Um, Kim's got Pack and Pray scheduled a uh, week from Tuesday. The 5th. Come on and, and help us get those bags packed. How many are you set to do? 200 bags. Um, I was also thinking about that train ride <laughs> for the ladies. Kim and I went and we took the rail runner last Saturday. We went to Santa Fe just to, to see how everything worked out, see uh, how the timing worked out. Um, we got to ride the rail runner. Talking about knowing the way. I really appreciate the rail runner. After driving to South Dakota, for 2,100 miles round trip. I appreciated sitting on the train, at least getting to Santa Fe without having to drive and just getting a chance to re rest and relax and, and look around uh, a whole lot better than sitting on the freeway and worried about traffic and who's passing who and speed limits and all those driving things. Uh, so ladies, if you got a chance, uh, to go on the trip to Santa Fe on the Rail Runner, uh, I guarantee you it's a relaxing thing. You're going to have people to, to sit and visit with, not to mention Tomasita's. That was pretty good chili. That was pretty good food there. Gene's got thumbs up for Tomasita's. That was good food. Uh, so if you've got free time, make sure to do that. Talk to Kim about uh, getting your tickets set up. Any other things that we need to let people know? All right. Ted? Would you close us with a prayer and a song this morning, please? Will do. Please bow your heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, so thankful to be in this group this morning to praise you and worship you. And also, Father, more than anything, to praise you that we have the opportunity to know those who have gone on before us. And we have your word which is never ending. That you are the way, the truth, and the life. And all we have to do is to look to you whenever we're troubled, whenever we're lost, confused, <coughs> look to you. And we thank you, Father, for all that you've provided for us. May we give back graciously that which you've given us because we know, Father, you multiply it much greater than we do. So, Father, we tell you we love you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Reach out and take the hand of somebody next to you. I love this part. Love it.